Well, if you're listening online, we are having a day of celebration of music here at First Church, and I've chosen Psalm 100 as the uh, text for the sermon and the title, The Gift of Music. You know this psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God, it is he that made us and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture and enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. The word of the Lord. The psalmist says, come into his presence with singing. Come into God's presence with music. Could you imagine a world without music? A bride would have to walk down the aisle with no music. We had a wedding here last evening and I was thinking about that. That's a long aisle. And all you would hear would be the clip-clop of the nervous feet. But instead there was this beautiful music surrounding her father and her and her family and their friends and music took us to another place. If there was no music, there'd be no hymns to sing, no love songs, no singing at all, and there would be no dancing, which would make the Baptist happy. (laughs) There'd be no concerts. There'd be no symphonies, can you imagine? None. There would be no country, jazz, pop, hip hop, blues, folk, or classical music, not at all. So what would the world, this world, be without music? We don't wanna know. And have you ever thought about how strange it is that when we Christians get together, we always sing? We always sing, every time we get together. No matter how different we are on the issues, no matter how politically divided we might be, we stand up and sing the same song. And it unifies us, and that doesn't happen anywhere else. You don't go to the hardware store and sing with everybody in there. You don't go in the lobby of the bank and everybody starts singing. We sing as an expression of our unity and of our faith, and maybe the world would be a better place if people would sing together. What if Congress all sang together? (laughs) What if the folks at the White House and the Capitol would get together and just sing some? It'd be a better world, maybe. (laughs) They'd probably argue on what song they were gonna (laughs) sing. And who got to sing first and, you know, all that. But in theory, music brings us together, doesn't it? So we always sing. It's an odd thing. I know you don't stop and think about that much, but we stand and we get a hymnal and we sing the same song and we express our faith and our unity in spite of our differences. Music is like prayer and it's like missions. Sometimes we think a church should be all about missions. I think the church is about outreach. But it also has to be about inreach, and it has to have both vowels of the heart working, the input and the output, and one without the other is an unhealthy church. And music is a part of that intake valve. It's a part of what nurtures our faith and our community, like Bible study, prayer. It's a part of our journey of faith. Another way to look at it is music's like a train that carries our emotions for us. So much of what we feel is expressed in our music. And words alone can't do this, unless I've got a little experiment for you. So I wanna try this, okay? I'm gonna read these words that you know so well. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin, mother and child. 
Holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Well, that's okay, isn't it? But now let's sing it. Can you do a verse of that? Silent night. Here we go. Silent night. Where did that take you? Yeah, a lot of different places. Christmas. Not just a Christmas. That song just took you to every Christmas. Every Christmas you've ever had that you can remember from a child until today, the train of music just took you on that trip of emotions and memories. And yes, we sang a Christmas song in May. Music is a gift. It's God's idea. I don't think, and I don't think you think, that we humans created notes and instruments and harmonies and dissonant and tempos and rhythms. I think it was a gift. All I have to do is hear a Motown song, just one, you know, like old, the old beach music. All I have to do is hear one Motown song and I turn, I go back to being 18 years old at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, doing things that we are not gonna talk about in church. <laughs> I get right back there. If, you know, and I have a, uh, my, my playlist is full of beach music, so I stay 18 most of the time. <laughs> it transports us. Some of you may be watching, uh, as I am, the CNN uh, series Soundtracks, uh, songs that defined history. And you can get it on demand if you're not watching it as it comes out. And, and in this series, it, it, it takes a 10-year period of time and talks about the music of that era. Woody Guthrie wrote, This Land is My Land in 1940. And he wrote it, quote, as an annoyed response to the blinding optimism that the late 30s hit God Bless America had. Have you thought about that? I didn't know that. So this land is my land is a reaction to the over-optimism, according to Guthrie, of God Bless America. Music. Peter, Paul, and Mary wrote, If I Had a Hammer, you know the song, as an expression of what people were feeling during the civil rights movement and the march on Washington in 1963, if I had a hammer. Helen Reddy wrote, I am woman, you know, hear me roar, in the 70s, and she wrote it as a positive protest supporting women's rights. Music. Billy Joel wrote, New York's State of Mind. And he wrote it in response to 9-11. Two numbers we will never forget. And there have been songs protesting Vietnam and racism and discrimination. Lady Gaga wrote Born This Way in support of gay rights and marriage equality. And yes, I did mention Lady Gaga in a sermon. Her mother would be so proud. But the list is endless, isn't it? I mean, Bach, the Beatles, the Stones, Luther, Johnny Cash, John Wesley, and Charles Wesley, and all the rap artists, which isn't my thing, but they are all using music and have used music to transport us like a train 
from where we are to somewhere else. They used music to capture our thoughts, but maybe more importantly, our emotions. If you think about it for just a minute, your entire life has been marked by music. Pain and suffering, peace and praise, joy and anger, romance. All of these have been transported on the train of music. We, don't, we wouldn't have a world without it. And if we did, it would be a world we wouldn't want to live in. The Bible's full of music. I'm sure you've picked up on that. Moses sang in the Old Testament, and he sang, and he had a speech impediment, and he sang. So it doesn't always have to be perfect music, okay? And I'm looking at you because your music is always perfect. But sometimes we make a joyful noise. <laughs> Okay. Moses saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The Lord is my strength and my might. He gave those words wings with a song. The Psalms in your Bible are actually all songs in your Bible. A hymn book right in the middle of your Old Testament full of songs. King David wrote Psalm 23, and we know that by heart and say it, but it was written to be sung, music. Our Jewish ancestors have given us the gift of music and worship and singing what we think and what we feel. But the music is not for us, solely for us. The music is an offering to God. As Kierkegaard said, we're all on a stage this morning. Imagine this whole thing is the stage and there's only one person sitting in the audience and that person is God. And so all music is rendered not for you, but for the Lord. That's one reason we have, a, you know, kind of a difficult time with whether to clap or not. Have you noticed we don't know what to do with that? To clap or not clap in worship, if the music's not for me, if I'm not the audience, if God's in the audience, then the only person who should be clapping at our music is... Well, we don't hear God clap much. And if you do, uh, you need to make an appointment with me in the morning. <laughs> but the music's not entertainment for us, as Bart would say. It's not for us. It's our rendering to the Lord. So when we sing a hymn, we're not just singing for fun, we're singing as an offering. And so it should be the best offering that we should offer unto the Lord. And if you think about it, our clapping is kind of confusing. If we clap for our musicians, which we just did for the children, I knew I had you as soon as you did that. I thought, okay, now I've got clapping in my sermon, so this is going to be good. <laughs> when to clap, when not to clap. We want the children to know that we deeply appreciate their offering. We want them to know that you don't need to be nervous with us. We love you and we appreciate what you just did. And sometimes the silence after a child's offering could, could be kind of confusing for them, couldn't it? And so we clap for them. Sometimes we clap for the chancel choir, or we, or we clap for soloists to move us to a different place. One time you clapped for the sermon. I wish you would do that every week. <laughs> but if you think about it, if, you're clap, if all of us are making an offering to the Lord, then you really should clap for the ushers when they bring the offering up and don't drop the plate. You should say, good job, ushers. Yeah, that was great. Or when Mary Kay prays, you know, if it's a good one, you should say, yeah, Mary Kay, really good prayer. Suzanne, great prelude. Where would we stop clapping in worship if God is the audience and we're all on stage? It's sort of like all the actors are on stage clapping for one another. When the person in the audience is the one to whom we render our worship. Worship's a verb, by the way. I almost wish we'd change our language instead of saying, I'm going to go to church today, 
to change it to say, I'm going to worship. It's a verb. I'm going to do something. I'm going to render praise to God. This one person who sits in the audience. Clapping doesn't have to be irreverent, though, in church. I got mixed feelings about it, too, to tell you the truth. Sometimes I clap, sometimes I don't clap. I don't know when to clap, when not to clap. And the people at Starbucks, if they were here today and listening to me go on and on about clapping, they'd say, what are y'all so tied up about in terms of clapping? Well, I get that from the Starbucks folks, but it's, it's, in, it's important we understand what we're doing and why. That's what's important. It's worth talking about. Music is not entertainment for the congregation. It's an offering to God. That's a big deal. But to clap doesn't mean you're irreverent. Some people think reverence is silence. And so that if I'm silent and quiet, I'm being reverent. It's possible to be loud and be reverent. Because what reverence is, is having the right focus for your worship. You wouldn't want people to come into the church back there and have a big sign that says, no clapping, no joy, no laughter, no talking, and no cell phones. Okay, well, maybe no cell phones. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, welcome to first, you know. All these rules and regulations about what you can and can't do in here get so cumbersome that we can start to feel so formal. Sometimes formality can feel like death, like we're dead, like we're emotionless. Do you know what they call us? You know what the people outside of here call Presbyterians? Do you know what our nickname is? Anybody know? Can you believe that? They call us the frozen chosen. Does that hurt anybody else's feelings? How can you be a person of faith, a person who loves God, a person who seeks to love your neighbor and be frozen? I don't know. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen Frozen many times from this pulpit. That's a joke. <laughs> I look out and it just looks like a block of ice, you know? And I feel like somehow I gotta get through this, you know, and get through this ice. I've seen it when we stand up to sing and we kind of grunt out a hymn, you know, and it's sort of, praise God from whom all. <laughs> And I'm thinking, if the Lord's in the audience, the Lord's gone to sleep. <laughs> We've put God to sleep. That's probably why God goes to Pentecostal churches on Sunday and not Presbyterian churches. <laughs> it's just more fun. So you don't want to be a killjoy in worship. You don't want to be flippant. You don't want to be irreverent. You want to be respectful of who this audience is. This is the Lord Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth who deserves your very best worship. Nothing flippant, nothing, even though I use humor a lot, all humor, all clapping, all laughter, all music, all liturgy should be done with the deepest respect of who our audience is. It's for the audience. So we don't want to be a killjoy and we struggle with how we respond to people who make offerings that move us. I've often thought I clap because I want to say, I appreciate the offering you just made to the Lord for us. And I want to join you in that offering. But even that breaks down in some places. Music uh, is a powerful instrument. It can thaw a Presbyterian. We can be frozen until somebody starts playing music. And then you start to see the ice melt. We sang How Great Thou Art at my father's funeral years ago. And I can't sing that hymn today without going back to his funeral. It takes me right back to that funeral. And it takes me back to the emotions of, of losing him. It takes me back to 
his life and, and his ministry and all that he accomplished. That one hymn takes me all the way back in two seconds, transports me from here to somewhere else. And it's a wonderful thing, but it can be an overwhelming thing. Have you ever had music jump up on you emotionally and you didn't see the emotions coming? And they just kind of show up and you think, where did that come from? Music. It brought all those emotions back to you because we were meant to feel things. Even we Presbyterians, we were meant to have feelings, emotions. And you don't check those at the door in worship, you offer those to the Lord in worship. God created you to have feelings and emotions. Music is a gift from God, isn't it? If you think it is, say amen. amen. So you just felt something right there. Can you imagine a world without music? Bone dry world with no music. Well, thank God you don't have to. The psalmist wrote, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth and worship the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. So let's sing. Amen.